and uh, introduce the project overall. We'll talk a little bit about the background, where we are in the process, what, and eventually what's coming up, what we're looking ahead to. Uh, we'll give you a project status overview and introduce the components of the updated countywide multi-jurisdictional hazard mitigation plan, or MJHMP for short. Uh, there are several components. We'll also introduce the methodology employed in the update of the plan, and most importantly, discuss the proposed mitigation plan, the outcome of this, pro of this planning process, the outcome of the analysis that has gone into that planning process. Uh, the mitigation plan is arguably the most important part of this document as it represents the actions that the county and its participating agencies uh, will take over the next five years to address a wide range of hazards that are known to exist within the county of Santa Barbara. So we'll come back to the details on that, but that's uh, a focus of tonight's presentation. And then last but not least, after we've shared this information with you tonight, we would love to hear from you. Uh, we'll have an opportunity for, for public comment and questions um, at the end of the presentation. So we kindly ask you if you do have comments, please hold them to the end. Um, that being said, if you do have a, uh, uh, a question or a technical issue, um, feel free to use the chat function of our um, virtual workshop tonight. Um, by expanding the chat box, you can um, put comments directly into it and we'll be able to respond to them either um, as we go or we can hold those comments until the end during public comment. Great, so let's start with introductions. Uh, you've already heard from Mike and JD from the County of Santa Barbara Office of Emergency Management. They've been working on this process uh, since uh, late 2020, early 2021, when we kicked off the update officially. And um, my name is Erica Leachman. I'm a project manager with Wood Environment and Infrastructure Solutions here, uh, here in Santa Barbara. And um, I've been working with our team, including Gina Sawaya and Sydney Margallo, um, who are hazard mitigation planners, along with Jeff Brislon and Dan Jarrah, who are our technical leads on the process. Uh, we've been working hand in hand with the county, along with our 14 participating agencies in the county uh, to prepare the updated plan that is now available for public review. Um, we've been uh, working together consistently since we kicked it off and are excited to present the results of this process tonight. Great. So as I mentioned, there's a few ways to participate it, during the presentation. If you have questions, uh, feel free to raise a hand or add, a, add, a, add a, a comment in the chat box. When we do get to public comment, um, the raise your hand feature is uh, how you can get in line to provide a verbal comment. So go ahead and click the hand button and um, we'll call upon you. When we do, uh, unclick your microphone, uh, unmute yourself, and you everyone will be able to hear what you have to say. So we'll come back to that um, and uh, we'll take comments in order. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the project background. Uh, what's mo what relates most to this workshop tonight is that we've had two workshops so far. Uh, back in April of 2021, we kicked off the update of the 2022 MJHMP with a workshop focusing on the project background, the regulatory environment, and an overview of the project components. We asked participants to tell us what was most important, what was the range of hazards that are uh, are most most uh, important or most um, concerning for residents in Santa Barbara County, um, to give us some indicators about where this update needs to focus and where the priorities exist currently in, in the county, where things may have changed from past updates. Later in November of 2021, we had workshop number two, where we presented the results of a countywide community uh, hazard survey. Um, this survey was an absolutely critical part of our outreach process because it asked questions specifically about the range of hazards, what happens in response to things, in, in response to disasters for the people that live in Santa Barbara County, helps give us indicators about where there may be gaps in services or gaps in, um, in, uh, in coverage within the county and ultimately helps inform what can be done about it, developing the mitigation program. That workshop also provided an overview of our analysis of hazards and vulnerabilities throughout the county, ranging from natural hazards such as earthquakes and wildfires uh, to more uh, developed de development related uh, hazards such as um, utility failures. 
um, it, it, all the way to things that are human caused and uh, very relevant, such as the pandemic, the COVID-19 pand pandemic. So uh, what you'll see in the draft plan is the culmination of that analysis and um, the input that we've received from uh, the, the county community uh, so far. Ultimately, what you're seeing in this document is the, the mitigation strategies that were developed through this input and uh, through this consideration and iteration with the community. Great, so why is the hazard mitigation plan being updated? Well, the short answer is, is that it's required. Uh, the hazard mitigation plan is um, a requirement of the federal government of FEMA um, in order to be eligible for funding uh, for, uh, for for hazard mitigation. The and what's, why this is important, especially for Santa Barbara County, is that the money spent on preparation and the prevention of hazards in response to disasters, which are, which are inevitable. Um, help save money in the long run. So investing in the front end to plan ahead, to envision, to model, to map where these hazards may uh, manifest over the course, over the future the course of time in the near term, helps uh, uh, our emergency managers and our hazard managers uh, be prepared and avoid those, those situations in the future, which saves money and saves lives. So FEMA requires this every five years of any jurisdiction that is seeking federal funding for hazard mitigation. Uh, we have to have a current plan. It has to be updated on a five-year cycle. And our last plan was completed in 2017. So here we are in 2022. It's time for a new plan. And um, this, this plan, when adopted um, and certified by FEMA and Cal OES, which is the California Office of, of um, Emergency Services, uh, keeps the county and all of our participating agencies our, our cities and several of our um, local districts eligible for grant funding. Without a certified plan, you're not eligible for grant funding. So it's a very important step and an important local tool that we have. Um, ultimately, the takeaway is that having an updated, current, relevant hazard mitigation plan for your agency helps reduce future losses through efficient planning. It's a plan for avoiding those impacts in the long run. Great, so you heard me, re me mentioning participating agencies. And I wanted to uh, note this, import this important aspect of this plan. As a multi-jurisdictional plan, the, uh, the document includes uh, several other agencies other than the County of Santa Barbara. Um, agencies within the Santa Barbara County as a whole, but operate independently. Uh, this includes all eight of our cities, Buellton, Carpinteria, Goleta, Gav uh, Guadalupe, Lompoc, Santa, uh, Santa Barbara, Santa Maria, and Solvang, and also six special districts, uh, including uh, COM, the Kachuma Operations and Maintenance Board, the Goleta Water District, Montecito Water District, Carpinteria Valley Water District, the Montecito Fire Protection District, and the Santa Maria Valley Water Conservation District associated with Twitchell Dam. So those agencies are in included at, in, as part of this multi-jurisdictional plan. You'll see in the plan that the uh, evaluation of hazards, the evaluation of vulnerabilities include these areas of the county as well. It's not just a, count, a, a plan for the unincorporated areas. So that's an important aspect of this plan when you're reviewing it, that it applies to everyone. Um, how the plan uh, also was formatted is that the analysis of the hazards and then ultimately the vulnerabilities uh, manifest in the whole plan and then also in individual uh, annexes for each agency. So at adoption of the plan, the um, each agency will have its own special uh, section of the plan that incorporates and reflects specific information um, for that agency uniquely. How these agencies have been involved in this process is through two, two important groups. Number one is the Mitigation Advisory Committee uh, or MAC, M-A-C. The MAC uh, has representatives from every participating agency to ensure full participation and, uh, and involvement in the decision making that has gone into this plan. So it is a true multi-jurisdictional planning effort in addition to being a multi-jurisdictional plan. In addition, the MAC includes uh, other members of our community, other representatives from um, non-governmental organizations who are involved in hazard mitigation, public health and, and, uh, and uh, mitigation planning 
and then also stakeholders from the public who are uh, involved in county planning, um, particularly uh, related to hazards and, uh, and resource management. So we have a very diverse group of advisors that have been participating since day one on this process. Um, the, other at, the other group that has been instrumental in the development of this plan is the local planning team, um, the LPT. You'll see this reflected in, in, the, in the document. And the LPT comprises the experts in different aspects of, um, of hazard mitigation at, for each agency. So for example, in the County of Santa Barbara, the County of Santa Barbara's local planning team includes representatives from County Flood Control, the Public Works Department, the planning department, the parks division, uh, public health, et cetera. So we have representatives that are looking at hazard mitigation from a variety of, of angles, looking at all the facets um, as we're going along and ultimately helping us understand what the current priorities are and what our capabilities are in addressing hazard mitigation. This is also true for each one of our participating agencies. Each agency has a local planning team of the experts providing the information and the details um, as part of the plan. So you can see that uh, reflected in the data in, in the in the plan that's coming from our local our local agencies directly. Terrific. So now let's talk about the plan itself. We've introduced the background. We have introduced how the planning process has proceeded. Um, our, our key stakeholders, uh, our mitigation advisory committee, and our technical team. I'm going to turn it over to um, Sydney Margallo, my colleague, to talk about the plan, its components, and uh, how we've gone about the hazard assessment and the vulnerability assessment to inform our mitigation plan. Thanks, Erica. All right, so when you open up the plan, you'll see there are eight chapters in the plan. Um, the introduction, which is the first chapter, introduces the plan and provides a background on mitigation planning in the county, um, as well as what's new in this update of the plan. The purpose and authority chapter, which is chapter two, describes FEMA's requirements of mitigation planning to receive hazard mitigation, mitigation grant funding, uh, like Erica discussed a couple minutes ago. The planning process chapter, which is chapter three, describes the process for preparing the multi-jurisdictional hazard mitigation plan, including MAC and LPT coordination, like Erica just described, um, as well as public outreach, such as this public uh, workshop that we're having right now. Chapter four of the plan, which is the community profile and capabilities assessment, provides a description of the existing conditions within the county, including physical features, land use, the economic profile of the, of the county, as well as existing capabilities the county has in place to mitigate hazards, such as um, the county's administrative and technical capabilities, um, like their different departments that deal with hazards, their financial capabilities, um, which is like the annual budget, and regulatory capabilities, which is comprised of the county's plans, programs, and ordinances uh, in place in order to mitigate hazards. Chapter five of the plan, which is the hazards assessment, establishes the hazard prioritization and assesses um, the hazardous events that may occur in the county, um, including where they occur, the probability of occurrence, and climate change considerations. The vulnerability assessment uh, is chapter six of the plan, and this assesses the risks that these hazards present in the county. Uh, the mitigation plan which, like Erica said, is probably the most important part of the plan, is Chapter 7, and the mitigation plan summarizes the progress made on previous mitigation actions from the 2017 Hazard Mitigation Plan and sets a plan for future mitigation uh, within the county, including mitigation priority, um, the funding for these mitigations, and who is responsible for implementing each of the actions. Finally, Chapter 8, um, which is the plan maintenance chapter, describes how the county and participating jurisdictions will maintain and uphold this plan, including annual meetings, um, 
in order to assess the progress on the plan and um, future planning for future iterations of the plan. And then, as Erica described, we have the annexes um, for each of the participating agencies. They will have their own mini hazard mitigation plan called a local hazard mitigation plan, and those will be specific to each jurisdiction. All right, and we will give you a status overview of the countywide multi jurisdictional hazard mitigation plan. So here we have the um, hazards that are identified in the chapter five hazards assessment of the plan. And you'll see when you read the hazards assessment that these hazards are organized into four different categories. Um, so we have natural and destructive hazards such as wildfire, drought, earthquake, flood, um, weather and storm hazards, urban and human caused hazards and infrastructure failures. So as part of the hazard assessment chapter of the hazard mitigation plan, our team identified hazards that threaten the Santa Barbara County community. And this included refreshing our understanding of the known hazards that were included in the 2017 hazard mitigation plan, such as earthquakes, severe weather and oil spills, um, which have not changed substantially since the 2017 plan was published. This process also included researching and assessing new hazards that have either become more severe in the last five years or were just touched on in the 2017 plan, um, such as wildfire, drought, flood, mud flow and debris flow, pandemics, and coastal hazards like sea level rise. So, excuse me. So the hazards assessment focuses on hazardous conditions that have changed substantially in the last five years since the 2017 plan. And then to assess the priority of these hazards, we looked at the results of the public survey um, that was done in 2021. We also asked the participating agencies to look at four factors, including the frequency or probability of the hazard occurring in the county, the geographic extent of the hazard or where these hazards can occur within the county, the potential magnitude or severity if the hazard were to occur, and the overall significance of the hazard. So once we understood how these hazards were rated for all four of these factors, we were able to prioritize them. We also organized the hazards by these four main categories, as you see here, and the hazards here are then organized in these categories and then ranked from highest to lowest priority for the county, and that's how they're organized in the plan. All right. So like I said, we took written and verbal feedback from key stakeholders and the public in order to rank these hazards. Um, we asked that the participating agencies fill out paperwork documenting um, those four categories, frequency, extent, severity, and significance of each hazard. And we also hosted several meetings with the agencies and other stakeholder groups in order to discuss priority of these hazards for the plan. Um, all right, in this 2022 update, you'll see that mud flow and debris flow, coastal hazards and pandemic ranked a lot higher in priority than they were in the 2017 plan. And this is also reflected in our mitigation strategies that we'll talk about later. All right. So in our chapter five hazard assessment, we have hazard profiles for each of the hazards that were identified in the last um, couple slides. So for each hazard profile, we will include a description of the hazard, um, which will give a description of what the hazard is and associated issues, um, followed by details on the hazards specific to Santa Barbara County. 
We give a description of the location and extent of the hazard in Santa Barbara County. This section gives a special, excuse me, a spatial description of the potential locations or areas of the county that the hazard is expected to impact. This section also describes the potential strength or magnitude of the hazard as it pertains to the county. We also, <clears throat> excuse me, include um, the history of hazard in Santa Barbara County. So that includes information on historical incidents, including impacts where known, um, the plan update guide worksheets that we got from each of the participating agencies were used to capture the latest information um, on past occurrences of hazards throughout the county, including in these jurisdictions. The hazard section also includes the probability of occurrence, so this describes the frequency of past events um, and that's used to used in this section to gauge the likelihood of future occurrences of these hazards. Where possible, the frequency was calculated based on existing data, and it was determined by dividing the number of events observed by the number of years on record and multiplying by 100. Uh, this gives the percent chance of event happening in any given year. For example, if three droughts occurred over 30 years, that equates to a 10% chance of a drought um, occurring in any given year. The likelihood of future occurrences is categorized into these classifications shown here, which is highly likely, um, likely, occasional, and unlikely. And last but not least, each of the hazard profiles in the hazard assessment includes a discussion of climate change considerations, which describes the potential for climate change to affect the frequency, intensity, and location of any of these hazards in the future. All right, our chapter six vulnerability assessment summarizes the impacts created by the interaction of the hazards that we identified and assessed in the chapter five hazards assessment of the plan um, and the hazards interactions with the county's key assets or critical facilities, as we'll call them in the plan. So critical facilities are what FEMA considers lifelines and infrastructure that are important to communities. This includes important roads within the county, fire stations, electrical substations, and other energy infrastructure. Uh, this also includes health and medical facilities. So these critical facilities um, are identified by the participating agencies uh, as important. Um, they might also include schools if those were identified by the participating agencies. So after we assess the hazards, our team models where these hazards are in relation to the county's critical facilities in order to see what has the potential to be affected or to see what is vulnerable to these hazards. And again, to point out what's changed since 2017, we should note that we looked at vulnerabilities more clearly affected by climate change and we took a closer look at the hazards that disproportionately affect disadvantaged communities to see how these communities are particularly vulnerable to these hazards. And here we go. Um, the methodology for the vulnerabilities um, was all done countywide for each of the hazards. Um, so a model was used to calculate losses due to earthquakes. Um, this model is called HAZIS, and it shows um, building losses, and especially losses to critical facilities from earthquakes. We separated it um, into three different um, models. We did one model which I think it's called a probabilistic model, and this shows 
the building loss um, and impacts from earthquakes that could happen um, from any of the faults within the county. We also modeled um, building loss and impacts from an earthquake that occurred in North County and one that occurred in the South County. So you'll see all three of those models in our vulnerabilities analysis. For the critical facilities analysis, we looked at hazards that could have a measurable impact on the county's critical facilities. Um, and these two approaches, the model for earthquakes and the um, our methodology for impacts to critical facilities can only be applied to hazards that have an exposure area, for example, um, a hazard footprint. Um, and this hazard footprint can be mapped relative to the critical facilities and the properties within the county. For those hazards where an exposure layer does not exist, for example, pandemics or civil disturbances where we can't map where the hazard can occur, a qualitative assessment was uh, presented in our vulnerabilities assessment. All right, and now we're going to talk about our mitigation plan, and I will pass the mic back over to Erica. Great. Thank you so much, Sydney. Uh, terrific. So now getting to uh, to to the the output, the outcome of the process, the analysis that we did relative to where the hazards are, what their extent is, and what would happen if those hazards manifested. The point of doing all that is to figure out what to do about them. What mitigations, what actions could the county and its participating agencies take to either avoid those hazards or respond to them in the best way possible? And the point of developing mitigations and planning ahead is to ensure that we have um, programs that are triggered in response to different scenarios that may that may occur in the future, ranging from natural hazards to human caused hazards to pandemics, um, all informed by uh, experience. Um, uh, years and years of experience responding to different things that have occurred in the county from windstorms to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so in developing the mitigations, we're building off of the experience that the county and our and our cities and our agencies have 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 to date and um, setting mitigation goals and objectives as a first step in developing a mitigation plan. The MAC and uh, and our team work together to develop a fresh set of goals and objectives to, to guide the development of mitigations. Those are included in Chapter 7 of the plan. In thinking about how to implement those goals and objectives, uh, uh, the team looked at a range of opportunities for mitigation from development standards to specific action items such as physical improvements to creek culverts, for example, um, to things like programs, including outreach and education programs that can better prepare Santa Barbara County's residents to be responsive and resilient in the face of hazards. So so those range of tools were in our toolbox uh, when we were when we were developing and refining the proposed mitigation program. We were also inspired by the good work that's already on the books. Uh, what's true about a mitigation plan is that we're not starting from scratch. From the uh, from general plans to emergency action plans, there's a lot of existing uh, planning uh, and and measures that are on the books already that this plan has incorporated and been inspired by. So you'll see that in the mitigation program that uh, we're reflecting the existing uh, pro uh, existing capabilities within the county. Once the mitigation program is developed, it's a pretty it's a pretty wide spectrum of actions that can be taken. Some of them are low hanging fruit and some of them are a little bit more, more complicated or long term. And so in order to help focus uh, uh, focus the uh, the county and our participating agencies on the on the highest priority mitigations in the near term. The mitigations were uh, prioritized based on a set of uh, of criteria. You'll see these on the screen here, um, uh, and you'll notice that if you uh, use their first letters, it spells stapley. So you'll see this reflected in the, in the plan. The stapley criteria stands for social, technical, administrative, political, legal, economic, and environmental. These are the different facets of mitigation that were considered in ranking the mitigation priorities, uh, considering things including uh, whether it's politically palatable. Is it legal? Is it something that can be done? What are the environmental ramifications of a mitigation? How are there staffing? Uh, is there staffing available? Is there funding available? 
these are the questions that were asked um, in developing the mitigations to ensure the mitigation program is uh, timely, relevant, and, uh, and feasible to be implemented, particularly in the near term as a five-year plan. So let's talk a little bit about the mitigations themselves um, and the relationship to funding. Uh, the mitigation plan, as I mentioned at the top of the presentation, is an important tool for the county to pursue uh, federal funding for the actions themselves. The mitigation plan represents a wish list, a range of ideas for how to address the known hazards and vulnerabilities that have been identified in the county. Uh, they ultimately support the goals and the objectives, um, but they're also con conceptual. There's no site-specific um, information or specific implementation info included. It's more about identifying the range of ideas that we could develop into projects and pursue over the course of impl implementation of the plan. What's also true about the mitigation program is that it picks up where 20, the 2017 plan left off. For any action that was either deferred or hadn't been started yet from the 2017 plan, our current plan includes those actions and, and keeps them going while also uh, including additional mitigations to address current priorities. For each mitigation, there's a few components that are very important. Number one, we have to describe what that mitigation is. Number two, we want to identify what the ballpark cost is, you know, orders of magnitude so that we know what we're, what we're pursuing, and also identify potential funding sources. In most cases for hazard mitigation, the funding source comes from either local sources and most importantly, federal and state sources through, uh, through federal uh, hazard mitigation funds. And, um, and uh, that's an important thing to identify for each mitigation so that future implementers of the plan know, uh, have a starting point uh, where to go to um, pursue the project, develop the project, and ultimately fund the project. Uh, the timing on the, on the action is important. Um, since this is a short-term plan, relatively, a five-year plan, the timing should happen within the next five years or as an ongoing program. And then last but not least, each mitigation measure identifies the responsible parties. So uh, be it in a department of the county, representatives from every participating agency, it's important to know who's, import who's responsible for implementing the different mitigation measures. Great, so when it comes together, we wanted to show you an example mitigation. Each mitigation has these components and looks about like this. There's a title for the mitigation in this case, Case, we're showing you a wildfire resilient design information uh, mitigation measure. This is one example. We have a, a brief description of the mitigation and then those components that we uh, just described, uh, including what, what hazard the mitigation is intended to address, its priority, uh, when it would happen, how much it costs, where funding could come from, and who's going to implement it. So uh, with those components, we have a clear plan, a clear strategy going forward, and something that's actionable and also able to be uh, monitored and reported on uh, annually over the course of the plan implementation. Great. So tonight, we don't have time to go through all of them. I believe there's about 90, 90 mitigations, and, and we could, but we'd be here for a long time if we reviewed every single mitigation. So we do encourage everybody uh, to open up the plan, you know, get to Chapter 7, and to see the full range of mitigations and how they cover the range of hazards that, that um, we've identified in the plan um, for this update. But tonight, we did want to uh, identify and discuss a few key new mitigation measures. Uh, these mitigations that you see on the screen here were developed specifically in response to either new hazards that were identified through this update or hazards that were reprioritized uh, based on public input and have jumped up on the list of, of, of priorities for the county um, and needed some additional specific attention. Examples of that uh, include, uh, include drought and water supply. In 2017, drought and water supply was pretty far down on the priority list. And in response to our latest and greatest information and also the, uh, the, the opinion of our communities and the experience of our communities in the last five years, that ha hazard in particular has shot up on the priority list and warranted additional uh, attention in the mitigation plan. So planning for drought and water supply uh, is a new um, aspect of the mitigation plan that was not as strongly represented in past updates. Similarly, uh, the pandemic, what we've learned from responding to the COVID-19 pandemic has now manifested itself in a mitigation strategy that is informed by what we've learned working with public health, our local healthcare providers, and our cities. 
uh, in response to uh, what was needed over the course of uh, dealing with the pandemic for the last two years. Um, another key issue that has, has uh, become more of a focus of this plan is coastal resource management uh, in response to sea level rise and uh, most importantly from a hazards perspective, uh, coastal hazards. So erosion, a wave run up, coastal flooding, those issues being exacerbated by changing coastal, uh, coastal conditions uh, warranted some attention on some unique strategies to address and protect the shoreline, create a, res a more resilient shoreline to um, a sea level rise. Granted, this is a short term plan. So, you know, planting the seeds now to look forward uh, for, for climate change over the next you know, 50, 70, 100 years is an important step that we can take um, to make sure that issue remains relevant. So one example of a new mitigation measure is a sediment management program that considers opportunities for beach nourishment and interagency coordination to ensure that adequate beach quality sediment is available when beach nourishment projects, uh, you know, become a reality along the coastline. Um, another key issue that came up uh, and a key hazard is extreme heat planning. With uh, climate change and uh, the changing conditions that we're experiencing uh, during longer summers, hotter summers, higher temperatures, uh, it, the interest in seeing mitigation for heat, um, for extreme heat was brought into the plan, addressing things such as developing um, uh, energy resiliency plans to ensure that we have cooling centers, uh, ensuring that uh, there are shade shade built into our parks and our public spaces, things like that that create a more resilient environment in the face of, of hazards and vulnerabilities that exist now and in the future. And then uh, another example of something that's new, not a new topic, um, but it relates to wildfire. Wildfire has long been a high priority hazard within the county of Santa Barbara, but new opportunities to address wildfire in new ways um, have, ar have arisen through this update. So, for example, interagency coordination through the regional priority plan and the wildfire mitigation program uh, that are separate processes that are happening within the community and within our agencies um, that this plan can help support. So when you're reviewing Chapter 7, when you're reviewing our mitigation program, you'll see some of these new ideas um, woven into this mitigation program to address some of these higher priority uh, hazards and vulnerabilities that arose through our outreach and, and research that went into this program. Great. So with that overview, let's talk about next steps, what to expect. Right now, the draft plan is on the streets. It's available for review during a public comment and review period. It started on March 1st and it closes on March 15th. So we are looking forward to receiving any public input before that time. Uh, at the same time, um, we are working with our participating agencies to complete the jurisdictional annexes. So basically taking the analysis and the work that was been done countywide and isolating the issues specifically for individual cities into their individual annexes. So that's that's happening right now. You can expect to see those documents available um, on local uh, agency websites and as part of the whole plan later this summer. Um, and then our, our next step, our next our next milestone is to submit the draft to FEMA and Cal OES for uh, for review. Uh, since this plan is being prepared under state and federal law, we need to ensure that it meets the those laws and, and achieves the goals of those laws and can be approved. So that it, that review loop is an important step in the process and it must happen before local adoption. Our target is to uh, reach local adoption stages for the plan in September 2022. That's when the 2017 plan expires. So we want to make sure that this plan is ready to go to replace it at that time. So over the next few months, if you stay engaged with the process, which I hope you do, you can expect these remaining milestones um, to uh, to reach your inbox as we go forward. Great. So as part of this uh, this public outreach process and part of the plan review, um, we want to uh, welcome written comments, written public comments. Uh, the draft plan is available on uh, the county's website, County OEM. Uh, the website here is on the screen, but if you also uh, just Google the MJHMP for Santa Barbara County, mm -hmm. it'll pop up. Um, thank you, Gina. Just shared the direct link to, in, to the website in our chat box. Um, and any comments on the plan could be uh, submitted to, um, to JD. The address is here on the screen. I'll read it for those on the phone. It's 4408 Cathedral Oaks Road 
in Santa Barbara, California, 93110. Or you can email JD at J Sacedo, which is S A U C E D O at county of sb.org. And we'll accept written comments all the way through March 15 at 5.30. So we welcome, welcome that and, and invite everybody to review the plan and submit comments. Great. So we want to thank everybody for coming. We'll have an opportunity for public comments um, in just a moment, but we encourage everyone to stay involved and please share this information with your friends, your colleagues, your family. Um, we can check out the website for the full project record and more details. Um, feel free to follow the project on social media as well, um, on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. If you follow uh, Santa Barbara County Office of Emergency Management, you'll receive updates about this project as well as other, uh, other aspects of um, their services. And we also invite you to join the mailing list to receive updates. Um, the website is on the screen here, and it's also available on the county's website. So if you'd like to receive emails, please sign up. And ultimately, we welcome you to review the draft plan. Um, it's It's been a really great experience working on this. It's a lot of really wonderful information. It's helpful if you're a decision maker to a resident of the county to somebody visiting. Um, so we, we welcome that. Um, so with that, thank you for coming. We wanna open up um, the floor to public comments. So if you do have anything to contribute, feel free to raise your hand. Um, or uh, type a comment into the chat box. And um, if you're on the phone and would like to uh, make a comment, uh, feel free to unmute yourself and jump in. <laughs> Do we have any comments this evening? Okay, any verbal comments or written comments and give people just a, a minute to see if there's anybody typing. Oh, thank you, Yoli. Okay. I see somebody typing in the chat right now. Great. Oh, great. Okay, Joyce, we see your comment. Thank you so much. Um, first of all, for the congratulations, we appreciate that. And then uh, Joyce's question is, can you share more about the energy resilience plan and lessons learned or advice for other counties? It's a great question. So energy resilience um, became a topic early on in this process uh, in general um, because of uh, the county situation relative to its energy service providers, which are uh, 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 um, Edison, SoCal Edison, um, and PG&E. Um, given the county situation um, with these two service providers, they're kind of, the county's kind of at the end of the line for both bro both service providers. So it's rec it's been long recognized that a power failure for any one particular system could have some pretty widespread ramifications, and there's some built-in vulnerabilities there. But the reason that energy resilience really came to the forefront forefront in this update is relative to the uh, public safety power shutoffs that um, participants tonight may know about. Um, in response to extreme weather, particularly sundowner winds and windstorms that may uh, knock out power or, or, or say knock out power and increase the risk of wildfire, as is what happened during the Thomas fire and other ignitions throughout the state of California. Um, our, our electric utility providers are have implemented programs that intentionally turn off the power. other conditions become hazardous um, in the interest of wildfire. So with that program, it's a pretty high profile program and um, it's, it's something that we wanted to explain to folks as part of the plan and then also have, uh, have a, a mitigation program that addresses that locally, addressing particularly what local residents and agencies can do when um, um, when the power is shut off in the interest of uh, PSPS, uh, PSPSs. So um, with energy resilience, that how that manifested was um, uh, having backup power. So looking to opportunities for, um, for uh, emergency generators and um, also support services where if, if, if particularly for vulnerable folks, such as um, uh, you know, uh, folks in healthcare facilities, 
that those systems are built specifically to support those groups that would be particularly vulnerable without power, even if for a short duration, um, a day or so. So um, I might direct your attention to the details of that of that mitigation. Oh, great. Um, uh, you know, for for the the individual components, but that's in in summary what the intent was to have backup systems so that those that are particularly vulnerable to power outages would have resources within the community. Um, and as far as advice for other other counties, um, I think our best advice on that is is to communicate with local agencies. Um, everybody deals with these issues differently, and and communication has been key for our group. Um, to understand what folks have have done, you know what's worked in the past, where and when, um, uh, you know, power outages have created, uh, you know, serious problems for folks, and that helps guide your um, your development of specific measures or specific locations where backup services or other resiliency um, programs, such as you know, outreach and communication, would be most effective. Great. I hope that hope that was a helpful response. And it looks like we have um, another comment from Aaron. Um, thank you for the presentation. Thank you very much. Um, glad to see the consideration of climate change and the increased emphasis on debris flow hazards. Looking forward to spending some time with the document, learning more about the sediment management plan, and hopefully submitting any comments by the deadline. Thank you so much, and we'd appreciate some look, uh, you know, a look at that new program. Um, it's an important component and uh, an interagency component that is, that, is, that is very exciting. Okay, great. I see a few more. A few more, a few more minutes for comments. Okay, great. Oh, thank you, Joyce. That's helpful. Excellent. And if you do have any questions um, after reviewing and you want to follow up with us, um, absolutely, you can get in contact with our team. Our contact information is on the website, and we'd be happy to chat about it uh, about about that topic more. Okay, great. Let's see any other comments or questions before we uh, close our workshop for the night. Okay, hearing none, um, thank you all so much for joining, um, taking the time to be with us tonight, and also for taking the time to review the plan um, and provide any comments. As I mentioned, if you have questions, feel free to follow up. And uh, thank you for staying involved with the process. Have a great evening. All right, take care. Thank you.